along the, the, the coast in the Pacific uh, um, uh, Ocean. Uh, whereas the second earthquake occurred on September 19th, just 12 days apart. And this earthquake occurred 70 miles away from Mexico City. This is an area very widely populated, as you may imagine. Of course, the damages were quite different in, 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 because of these two earthquakes. Uh, the, the total number of uh, fatalities, unfortunately, it rise, uh, rose to 477 uh, people, 228 by itself in Mexico City during the September 19 earthquake. In total, uh, over 180,000 housing units were damaged and somehow, whether they were minor or moderate or had to be rebuilt. And uh, related to schools, about, uh, about 20,000 schools had to be rehabilitated. Uh, 36 buildings collapsed in Mexico City during the September 19th. 35 of them had been built before the 1985 Mexico City earthquake. Uh, two main lessons could be learned from these uh, two earthquakes, and I would say could be relearned. The first one is that those buildings that were properly, uh, properly designed, detailed, constructed, and maintained uh, performed pretty well. And that, that's something that, that, of course, is obvious uh, after the earthquake. But uh, it's important to keep in mind for future earthquakes that the performance of the structure is, it does depend on the structural layout, the detailing, the quality of construction, and how well the structure has been maintained. The second lesson is that we needed a post-seismic evaluation methods and protocols. And also, we, we, we need a seismic evaluation and rehabilitation standard uh, guidelines and manuals for, so that the structures could be preventively uh, uh, strengthen before the next earthquake, or in the worst case, we have enough tools in order for, for them to be rehabilitated, repaired, and strengthened after the earthquake. Uh, as, a, as a first uh, solution for, for the issue of the, of the norms, uh, we, dev we, we devised, we developed uh, what is called the standards for rehabilitation of concrete buildings damaged by the September 19, 2017 earthquake. This is an interim norm uh, within the Mexico City Building Code. Uh, that, has, um, that provides minimum requirements for analysis, design, construction, and inspection of, of buildings. And uh, is, it uses uh, the, the, the current uh, framework of the code. Uh, the fee factors were reduced by 15% in order to account for damage and for certainties due to the damage, except for flexion. And uh, we developed an acceptance criteria to decide to rehabilitate a structure based on drift, in this case, limited to 0.6%. The interim norm has basic requirements for most of the different rehabilitation techniques that have been used so that it aids the designer and the contractor on how to perform these uh, rehabilitation techniques. After these, a, a group of researchers have been working on developing seismic repair and strengthening and resilience increase in Mexico through evaluation, rehabilitation, the social dimension of resiliency and the dissemination of all the, the, the results that we have obtained. The main aim is to increase the resilience of our communities. So with the participation of a group of uh, several universities in Mexico, UNAM of course, Universidad Metropolitana, University of Chiapas, Colima, Michoacán, with the participation of some US universities, the University of Texas at Austin, University of Texas in San Antonio, in Colombia, Universidad Militar Nueva Granada, and some companies in, in Mexico, with the sponsorship of the federal government in Mexico, the local government in Mexico City, the World Bank and other institutions and companies, uh, we have been developing, of course, papers before, thesis and dissertations, but for the practice, we have been developing norms, guidelines, manuals, design and construction best practices and recommendations. And I will talk a little bit of what we have been doing in, in the past couple of years. Uh, first of all, in the, on the post-seismic evaluation methodology, we developed a, a methodology that is, is aims at defining the structural safety and achieve uniformity in the classification of damage of school buildings. This is a three-tier evaluation method that uh, is included in three volumes. Uh, it has, is mandatory throughout the country for all school buildings. And we are working for extending this methodology to be applied in the, in the country for all types of constructions. This is how it looks, these uh, three volumes. The first volume itself is the methodology. The second is an introduction to seismic behavior of structures. And the third one is a field manual that is a summary of the methodology so that people in the field could use it. In this uh, website, you may find the, these three uh, volumes in PDF or so you can uh, download it freely 
of course, these are written in Spanish. Um, the, related to the first volume, the, the evaluation methodology includes inspection forms for the two types of, uh, of inspections that, that we, we are considering after an earthquake, what we call a rapid or, or fast evaluation method and intermediate evaluation method. You can see the spectrum forms for the first one. And we also include, uh, include tables like these that, uh, that depict the modes of behavior and the stiffness, the strength, and deformation capacity reduction factors. So that people can, uh, engineers, can look at the type of damage, you can classify the intensity of the damage, and also can assign the different lambda factors so that they can calculate what is the residual uh, strength, the residual stiffness, and the residual deformation capacity of the, ML of the element. This is just a close up of one of those uh, tables in which you can see uh, the failure of a column, the diagonal tension failure of a column, and then it uh, has uh, a, a photograph uh, by one of our colleagues, an ACI member and uh, with a de uh, description of the damage related to the size of cracks and also the reduction factors that I just mentioned. We have these for concrete structures and masonry structures in the different modalities in which we use, for example, masonry. Uh, we also include a table like this in which you can prioritize the rehabilitation needed depending on the damage severity or intensity of the element of the structure, and also with the capacity and demand calculation uh, in order to identify whether the structure needs to an urgent uh, 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 intervention, which we call a red, or a not so urgent, but needed, of course, would be yellow, or you don't need to do anything now uh, so that you can tag the structure uh, as a yellow. Uh, we're using for the capacity calculation, a calculation of strength based on lower bound theorems of plasticity, uh, assigning different types of modes of failure the, 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 the current uh, strength uh, equations that you may find based on ACI in the Mexico City uh, building code. In, the, in volume two of this for seismic evaluation methodology, we have included tables like this with pictures and photos that show and, and explain to the reader what are the types of, of modes of behavior of masonry, concrete, and steel structures. We have illustrated this with uh, typical damage patterns that can be of aid to damage inspectors so that they know what type of damage they should be looking into, let's say columns, beams, being column joints or, or walls. And we also added some photos related to other types of failures. This is the case, for example, of geotechnical failures and hazards that occurred very, very often, in particularly in the epicentral regions uh, when the earthquake uh, occurs. Uh, in, the, in volume three, which is the field manual, we have a, a series of aids, uh, for example, uh, photos like the one on the left-hand side that shows you what to look in a building in order to attack it as a red building, uh, a flow chart so that you know what are the steps to be followed, uh, visual aids for the different types of failures and hazards. For example, this is the case of landslides or uh, field recommendations uh, so that you can use them uh, in the field, for example, for cordoning uh, structures. Uh, this is uh, the, a close-up of this, uh, one of these uh, figures that just depicts what are the points that you need to look into a structure, whether this is a one-story structure or a higher structure, and what are the type of hazards that you need to look into this. Of course, these photos correspond to school buildings because this uh, guideline was originally developed for school buildings. But as I said, we are trying to extend it to other types of structures. With the help of the, of the Mexican Council of Science and Technology and the University of Texas system, uh, the University of Texas at Austin and ourselves at, at UNAM, with the support of the Mexico City government, we developed an inventory of rainforest concrete buildings rehabilitated in Mexico City after 2017. Uh, we developed a database uh, with files on the general information, the type of soil and foundation, the characteristics of the structure foundation vulnerabilities, the damage uh, after the 2017 earthquake, the type of rehabilitation that had occurred before or after this uh, earthquake. We have uh, 208 buildings that uh, are part of the, our database. Uh, we have a detailed description of uh, all these projects that uh, come from records on the, from the Mexican Institute of Construction Safety in Mexico City, and also from information provided by the licensed design professional and construction managers that were involved in the project. Uh, we have damage reports, field studies, lab tests, calculations of the rehabilitation project, as well 
as the original and rehabilitation drawings, original drawings when they were available, which of course were a very, very small number of those. Uh, we have studied uh, different uh, information that we gathered. This is just one of those slides in which the relation between the structural regularity, the geotechnical zone and the damage intensity are, are presented. Uh, as you may see here, <clears throat> the largest damage, that is the larger, the, the higher bars, are related to those buildings that have, that have some irregularity, whether in plan or in elevation, whether these are located in subsoil or firm soil. In subsoil, uh, we have large bars in, uh, in severe and moderate damage, as you may see here on the, on the chart. But one of the things that struck us is that 70, 78% of all the buildings that were rehabilitated after 20, 2017 were either irregular or highly irregular, according to the Mexico City Building Code earthquake design standards. And that's one of the reasons that, that explains why uh, all these uh, several hundred buildings had to be rehabilitated, many of them with these some sort of irregularities, whether they have uh, they are prone to pounding, they have a vulnerability to their structure because they were built with flat slabs, or they have a weak of soft stories or setbacks, which are larger than 20% of the building plan uh, dimension. And that uh, this just highlights where these bars are located and the type of damage, whether severe or moderate. We also studied the type of rehabilitation techniques that had been applied in Mexico City after the 2017 earthquake. And as you may see here highlighted in yellow, the most common techniques are foundation retrofitting because uh, new walls or steel braces were added, concrete column jacketing and steel column jacketing were quite prevalent as well as jacketing or enlargement of uh, existing masonry walls that were covered with welded wire meshes and, and mortar. And uh, so this is quite interesting for us because that tells us where the designers are looking, the, the ways for improving the, the resiliency of the community and, and improving the strength of the structure at large. This uh, slide shows the type of information that we have gathered. This is the case of adding new rainforest concrete to walls. Uh, based on the statistics that we have, we know what is the percentage of uh, walls that have been built uh, uh, on the, whether they are concentric, eccentric, that have some jacketing uh, of the walls themselves, wind walls, into walls, where the vertical reinforcement is continuous or discontinuous, what type of concrete they have used, what the strength of the concrete they have used in, in the rehabilitation. Uh, also, uh, as a part of this project, we selected uh, 24 buildings up to now. Uh, these are buildings that were constructed between 1958 to 1993. These are, these are structures from five to 13 stories. Uh, these are rainforest concrete structures, although, although these are frames or flat slabs or frames with masonry walls supported on some type of foundation. Uh, we have a very detailed information <clears throat> from these buildings we know what are the rehabilitation techniques that have been used and we have in file uh, very detailed information of these buildings. The idea is that we could use these buildings in future earthquakes to assess them and also to learn of the, of the behavior of the uh, selected uh, rehabilitation techniques for, for these buildings. Uh, we have also <clears throat> been working on, on, on analytically or numerically studying the behavior of selected buildings. This is one of those buildings that were damaged in 1927 earthquake in Mexico City. This is a, a uh, residential structure that uh, had to be uh, rehabilitated by extending walls to the first floor and adding some walls uh, in the upper stories. And uh, this uh, building has it's been studied together by the University of Texas in San Antonio and ourselves. Uh, we are quite fortunate that uh, in, in, the, in the regard that there is an acceleration record very close by to these buildings. So we have been performing different types of analysis with, with the idea of, uh, of studying the, the, the documents that are available in the US and in Mexico related to the evaluation of buildings and also to assessment of the performance of rehabilitation structures. Uh, it was needed after the, the, the 20,000 schools that were needed on rehabilitation, it was needed to develop a technical guide in order to uh, provide some advice to engineers on how to rehabilitate the school infrastructure. So we developed this technical guide that is mandatory for throughout the country for school buildings. And uh, this is a basic methodology that we are using 
for developing a new uh, standard, national standard for seismic rehabilitation. Uh, again, this is a, a guide that is written in Spanish, and you may find it in the very same uh, link that I showed before, and uh, it, this is uh, free to, to download. Uh, the idea of this technical guide is that uh, it is to provide a, 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 uh, a framework in which the designer, particularly engineers, can develop the rehabilitation of structure. Uh, the, the, the structure of the, of the technical guide, the chapters, uh, follow uh, quite uh, closely the ACI 562 document. Uh, it has uh, chapters one and two on general considerations and requirements, uh, chapters three and four related to loads and the structural evaluation and analysis, chapter five that uh, talks about the, the main concepts and the main requirements for design, chapter six, which is the main uh, the, the, the main chapter of the document that talks about the different rehabilitation techniques, chapters seven, eight, and nine that talk about uh, the durability, construction, and quality assurance, and they provide basic requirements for uh, strengthening the structures or repairing structures that damage due to durability, and also requirements for construction and quality assurance. On chapter six, as I said, this includes uh, 16 sections, uh, the, this includes 15 different types of rehabilitation techniques, the ones that are most commonly used, whether from local repairs all the way for using passive control systems and the and strengthening of the foundation itself. And each one of them includes a description, uh, a scope that is, uh, talks about the deficiencies to be corrected, also it, it identifies or, or requires where to obtain the demands related to strength, stiffness, and deformation, how to perform the analysis of these different techniques, analysis requirements, design requirements, and also some requirements related particularly for each one of the techniques on the construction, inspection, and quality assurance. Let me just show you a couple of, of, of sample pages. This is the case of FRP jacketing. This is uh, how it looks in this uh, technical guide. It, it has uh, different types of uh, figures and, and drawings, as you may see here, some of them that were taken from ACI documents and uh, from ACI 440 uh, documents and from other sources from papers and, and other documents uh, throughout the world and also includes the practice that we have learned in, in Mexico over the years. And this is how it looks, the type of, of drawing and photos that we have included in, in our guideline in order for the designer to have a better look on what, what he or she is, is doing. This is the case of concrete jacketing. Uh, likewise, we provide uh, pictures on how to uh, provide confinement to a concrete to column to be jacketed with, uh, with concrete. In the middle page, you have some photos on how to uh, confine a big column joint that is going to be jacketed, both columns and beams. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have also uh, photos on a properly or improper detailing, uh, particularly in this case on how to bend the, the stirrups. And for example, if you are going to provide just a single leg or, or one uh, type of stirrup, uh, and like for example, on the left-hand side, we are uh, requesting the stirrups or the hoops to be uh, made of two pieces, not just one piece of two pieces that can overlap. For example, you can see here on the left-hand side, the one half of the hoop in blue that has to, that will overlap in, in opposite corners with uh, the one in, in yellow, so that it, it, it considers or uh, um, uh, it recognizes that it's uh, pretty much impossible in the field to bend a bar 135 degrees. And what we have found in the field that is typically only bent to 90 degrees, which we all know is not a proper detail. Uh, we are uh, well, with also this information. We are now developing a, a standard for evaluation of rehabilitation of existing buildings. This is uh, applicable to the Mexico City Building Code, but eventually could be used as a model um, uh, model standard for the rest of, of the country. So we are inputting information from the technical guide, from experimental research that I will explain in a little bit, uh, from information from collected from databases, numerical studies, and input from designers and contractors. And of course, there is a large group of people and sponsors who participate in this endeavor. This is one of those experimental efforts that are being conducted in the University of Colima, and uh, with the idea of understanding the resistant mechanism of 
and non-ductile reinforced concrete frames who are, be, who are rehabilitated with uh, masonry influence. Uh, the 21 full-scale one-story non-ductile frames are to be uh, built and tested in the, in the laboratory in the University of Colima. This uh, shows the type of reinforcement of the specimen, the specimen, the original specimen, which is this one here. It complies fully with the Mexico City building code, that is with the ACI code in general. And uh, this is the, the response on the upper, upper side that was tested up to 0 0.9, a little bit less than 0.9 drift in order to inflict some damage to the frame and to be repaired afterwards. The, the, the curve below is the similar structure with uh, less reinforcement and with non-ductile detailing. That is the spacing of the stirrups was much like, much like largely uh, spaced. Uh, these are some of the results that, uh, uh, that the group in Colima has obtained through Professor Alfredo Sanchez. Uh, these, uh, the bird frame is the black line, as you may see here. The behavior of the frame with, a, with an unreinforced masonry infill is the, the yellow, the, the, the green one. And with red, you see the confined masonry wall that is used as an infill. That means that the, 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 the masonry wall has some uh, small concrete elements that surround the masonry wall that connect this masonry wall to the frame itself. These are some photos of the, of the testing itself. And these are some of the characteristics of the materials, the properties of the materials that were used in the construction of these uh, specimens. These specimens were tested up to a uh, one millimeter crack so that this could be a strengthened. And uh, again, and this, is, this is the type of behavior once these specimens had been uh, tested. And this is for the, the case in which the, the, the confined masonry infill is there, but is not connected to the frame elements. It just cast again the existing uh, frame uh, elements. The one on the top <clears throat> is uh, for the bare frame with no damage. The one below is uh, with the bare frame that was damaged, as I explained uh, before. As you may see here, there is an, an in, in impact on the damage, on the response and the behavior. For example, at 1% drift, uh, the strength of the undamaged bare frame structure reach about 30 tons, whereas the uh, damage structure reach about 25 tons. So there is some effect in the, in the strength as more so than any other uh, characteristics in the, in the response. And uh, this is the, the, the type of, of a specimen that was built. You can see here on the right-hand side how the masonry infill is uh, built a, against uh, these uh, small concrete elements. You see the reinforcement, the vertical reinforcement on the edges here that uh, will be cast against the, the bird frame. Uh, this is what we call tie columns and uh, eventually a tie beam at the top. And uh, this is a very typical construction method used for load bearing walls. But in this case, we are adapting it to be used as an infill wall. Again, we tested these to a one millimeter crack in order to compare with other specimens. Once we, we, we tested these specimens, we, we, we repaired them uh, by attaching welded wire meshes to the masonry wall and cover it with a mortar, with a, a one inch cover mortar. And um, you see here the, the behavior of this structure uh, on the red line, with red line, you see the envelope of, the, of the, the behavior of the repair structure that is quite similar to the original structure that I just presented in the previous slide. So uh, with these, we could show that adding this into the wall, but also strengthening it with the welded wire mesh uh, although the, the masonry wall was already damaged, it can re recover the strength and pretty much the deformation capacity that the structure had. This is how it looked, the specimen at the end of the test. You see a very widely distributed cracking uh, on the mortar itself with minimal damage in the masonry on the back side, as you may see in the photo on the, on the lower side. Uh, another project that is being conducted by Professor Guerrero and the Institute of Engineering has to do with how to rehabilitate load bearing walls, masonry walls with a reinforced uh, mortar. Uh, in this case, 13 full scale one story load bearing masonry walls have been tested with different variables, level of damage, the wire size of the welded wire meshes, uh, the connection between the mesh and the masonry itself, and the use or not of fibers and different types of fibers mixed with the, within the mortar. And the, although we have tested this before, we have never tested uh, with the addition of steel fibers and synthetic fibers. This is the type of fibers that we have used and the dosage. 
uh, that we uh, that uh, that the professor Guerrero and his student used in in their test, and these are some of the results that had been obtained. Uh, and you can see at both walls. The one on the left hand side is the welded wire mesh covered with cement mortar. The right hand side with steel fibers in the mortar. Both of them have a very widely distributed incline cracking that uh, you know, that also provides for changing the mode of failure from a shear control failure to eventually, yes, a shear control failure, with, but, but with some uh, uh, yielding of the flexural reinforcement, the vertical reinforcement of the wall. This is the how it looked, the specimen on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, you see the hysteresis curves of the original structure, that means with no reinforcement, and how the strength was increased by adding a welded wire mesh and also adding to the welded wire mesh a fiber. And this is, this is the case of steel fibers. And uh, the blue, as you may see, uh, showed a very large increase in the strength reaching up to 35 tons uh, on the lateral load, whereas the original specimen had reached uh, about 12 tons or so. So there's a threefold increase in terms of the strength, but also an increase in deformation capacity and post-peak behavior of the, of the structure itself. Uh, we are also working on uh, the studying the steel jacketing of non ductile columns with plates and with angles and the straps. This is an ongoing a research program. We are testing a 12 full scale non ductile reinforced concrete in the first phase. And uh, we are varying the type of, of the sizes of the angles, the straps, whether the column has damaged originally or not, and uh, the type of, of, of bolting of these straps to the column. Uh, we are testing these columns in cantilever as, as many tests have been conducted. This is our, these are the details of the specimen. It's an 18 by 36 inch uh, column with um, number eight bars, number three strips, widely spaced, typically of uh, 1950s, 1960 construction. Um, that this column is similar to the column that was tested by Abutaka and others. And uh, with the idea that uh, although they have tested some different types of steel jackets, we could compare with the ones that we are using. This is the reinforcement prior to the, uh, to the placement of the formwork and eventually casting. This is how the column looked like on October the 6th, so just a few days ago, and the day after how the, the column was failed in a diagonal shear, as you may see here. And uh, currently the column is being repaired by using epoxy injection and epoxy mortar. And we want to retest it again and of course, the remainder of the columns with the steel jacketing, the angles on straps will come afterwards and we will test them with a similar testing protocol that we used, which is a 374. Uh, we have been also studying different uh, uh, ways for modeling parameters and also developing or, de or revising design methods for different rehabilitation techniques. With the idea of identifying these parameters and acceptance criteria, for a performance-based repair and strengthening framework similar to ACI 369. For these, we have assembled different databases for different or for distinct uh, uh, rehabilitation techniques. And we just talk about for the ones on new concrete walls and column jacketing. We have done these for masonry jacketing or masonry wall enlargement, but I will not talk today about this because of time constraints. But related to new concrete walls, we have a database with 98 specimens from different countries. Uh, most of these specimens are either one story or two stories. And uh, we, there are different ways in which uh, uh, experimental, experimentalists or researchers have connected the, the wall to the frame, whether they have used epoxy grouted vowels, ex expansion anchors, shear keys, or they have welded the reinforcement to the original frame, or in some cases, no connection whatsoever. And uh, so we have studying different walled configurations that have been uh, tested. And most of them, as you may see here, are infill walls. In very few cases, they are partial infill walls uh, and infill walls with openings. Uh, in some cases, uh, bird frames and monolithic walls were tested, which are quite useful because that tells us what is the performance or the, the behavior of the connections used. And this is what we are showing here. Uh, different types of failure modes have been identified, flexure, flexure shear, shear sliding, diagonal compression, and diagonal tension. And on the right-hand side, you see a comparison in those cases in which we have a monolithic wall that could be compared to the infill wall. The relation between the strength 
the lateral strength uh, of this inferior wall to the monolithic wall. As you may see with the light uh, blue uh, circles or ellipses, um, the, the ones that were uh, epoxy grouted and also the bars were welded to the column reinforcement and had the almost a, a perfect monolithic behavior. That means the ratio of the strength is equal to one. Similarly to the green bars in which the, the bars that were concentrated in wall edges were also welded to the original reinforcement of existing reinforcement. In, all, in other cases in which this welding did not occur, but epoxy injection anchors were used, uh, we did not achieve, or the experimentalists did not achieve a monolithic behavior. About 80% of the monolithic behavior was achieved, as you may see here on the left-hand side, or it used a expansive actor, uh, anchors, uh, expansion anchors, uh, the, the average probably is around 60 to 70%. We have also uh, tested uh, different uh, methods for calculating the fractional strength and the Fletcher and shear sliding strength. Uh, we have used the Mexico City building code and compass standard similar to ACI and also the Japanese standard. And uh, in both cases, the, the calculation of the, or the comparison between the shear measure in the test and the calculated strength is quite close to one with a very small coefficient of variation. Uh, we have also done this type of analysis for rainforest concrete column jacket. In this case, we have a database with the 60 specimens that include eight specimens that were tested as original columns and 52 that were jacketed. Uh, this, uh, the variation of the properties of materials and the sizes and uh, also the percentages of longitudinal and transverse reinforcement is quite wide. For example, if you talk about the strength of concrete, the, the mean uh, of the strength of concrete between the jacket and the original column was about 1.3, which is the jacket was, or the jacket and the column, the concrete in the jacket was about 30% larger than the, than the, the concrete in the original st structure, but the coefficient of variation is quite large. So that this is, makes the comparison among specimens quite, uh, quite uh, a challenge. Uh, most of the specimens were built uh, using a cast in place concrete or shuckrate, as you may see here. In uh, most of the specimens, well, 30%, uh, some sort of surface preparation was provided to the original concrete column. Um, most of the tests were done on under axial and lateral loads, and uh, the testing were uh, the, the jacket itself, the jacketed columns, uh, were uh, failed in, in flexure. Sixty-eight percent of them failed in flexure, where there's sixteen uh, in shear, ten only the uh, in, in actual compression. Those were the cases of columns that were only tested in actual compression, and, and very few that had other types of failure, as you may see here in this in this slide. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in this, uh, we have tested different types of, of models to assess the fractional strength uh, to the calculation, whether we have used a, uh, a parabolic distribution of stresses, let's say using hardness state distribution, or we have used equivalent stress uh, in blocks uh, as we use uh, typically in ACI 318, just uh, keeping in mind that we have two different types of concrete. The one shown here in blue is the existing concrete, the one in yellow shows the new concrete that is added to, to the jacket. And we also studied a combination of these to see just what would happen. These are some of the results that we have obtained uh, for bending moment strength. As you can see on the upper uh, left-hand side, all this, the relation between the test and the calculation, in this case, using a strength reduction factor of phi equal to one, 2.9, I'm sorry. Uh, you see that all points except one or two are well ab above one that tells you that all uh, these all of these methods would, would provide a reasonable estimation of, uh, of strength. And uh, similarly, we have done this for, for shear, again, using different types of method, whether you use uh, 318, 19, 369, the equation that is provided in ACI 369 for calculation of shear strength of columns. And we have also used the Japanese uh, standard for calculating the strength. And as you may see here on the upper table, uh, again, the mean is higher than one for all the cases. Uh, similarly, for those columns that were tested and the fail in shear, we only used four of the eight specimens that failed in shear. I'm talking about only this case of rectangular columns that failed in shear. In all these cases, whether you use uh, the different, uh, we consider the two the strengths of the two concretes, or we made an equivalent section with an equivalent concrete strength 
the calculations here for Fletcher and for Shear are conservative, whether you use uh, ACI method or any other method. We have also been working on uh, developing numerical studies for different types of, of buildings, uh, studying them with different levels of complexity. In some cases, we have been able to calibrate our models through ambient vibration testing. And when it was necessary, we have been modeling the soil structure in interaction. Uh, in, in this case, uh, one of the buildings that we have studied with uh, our colleagues from the University of Texas is uh, one of those buildings that was damaged in the earthquake in 1979 in Mexico City, again was damaged in 1985 and uh, had been studied extensively before. Uh, this is the Durango building, as you may see uh, here, and this is the model that was uh, developed. And uh, in this case, uh, the model was, was uh, studied uh, numerically and experimentally through ambient vibration testing, and also the analysis included a fixed base and the consideration of the soil structure interaction. Uh, for the analysis of the structure, again, uh, away from 300 meters away from the building, we have a, a station that recorded the, the, the September 19, 2017 event shown in the record here that was used for assessing the, the structure itself. Uh, we have been also working on studying different types of school buildings. This is the case of a one-story school building that is heavily, uh, was heavily, widely found in, the, in, in Mexico and different parts of, of, the, of the country. And we have performed capacity uh, design uh, principles, have applied capacity design principles and, and capacity analysis for these uh, structures. And uh, we have uh, studied uh, to see if those structures would comply with the immediate occupancy type of performance level. And one of the things that we have learned in this case, particularly, is uh, for certain types of soils, for example, firm and soft, uh, some of these structures, uh, one story structures, do not comply with the performance level on immediate occupancy. And we have uh, developed similar analysis with different rehabilitation techniques in order to show the, in this case, the Ministry of Education, how to improve the rehabilitation and the strengthening of these houses, of these schools. Um, we have been uh, also working on dissemination of our own uh, results. Uh, of course, we use social media as, as I suppose is mandatory in this, in this age. And this is something that has been, uh, has provided to be quite useful, particularly for um, having uh, access to communities that otherwise would be quite difficult to, to have access to. Uh, this is the case of young students of uh, our engineering or architecture in different parts of the country. Actually, we have had the different visitors to our social media channels from other parts of uh, Latin America. Uh, this, uh, uh, this includes uh, uh, in our dissemination efforts, the material that we have developed, technical guides and, and manuals, as well as we are now developing uh, recommended reinforcement details for different rehabilitation techniques. One of the things that we have learned by revising the rehabilitation projects of school buildings is that each designer uses different uh, detailing requirements in some cases uh, uh, at odds uh, to, to others and to, to the manuals themselves and to the guides. Remember that we do not have a, a, a standard or a norm in, in Mexico uh, in order to provide, let's say, a hard requirement on the detailing. So we are basing this so far in guides and manuals. So uh, one of the ideas that we have developed is, is this uh, the development of this recommendation uh, a, a, a for the reinforcement details. And we are also working on developing videos in order to show what are the best practices for each of the rehabilitation techniques. This is the type of detailing that we have developed. Of course, this is written in Spanish. And, uh, but this is the type of, of material that we want to produce in order to uh, distribute uh, among uh, engineers, uh, designers, contractors, and uh, inspectors in order for them to look uh, carefully whether when they are designing constructing or inspecting structures, what to, what to look in, in depending on, on their own, on the relative role. Uh, related to the technical videos that I mentioned, uh, these are being developed for the most commonly used techniques. Uh, this is frame jacketing, where you design concrete or steel, new concrete walls, masonry wall enlargement, or what we call in Mexico wall jacketing, or a crack injection. And uh, these videos, which are about five to, to 10 minutes uh, in, in length, uh, will be aimed at design, construction, and inspection professionals, 
building owners and building officials. The idea is for them all to have the similar type of knowledge and uh, let's say homogeneous and uniform knowledge of what, for example, is a, a, are the requirements for adding for a new, a new concrete wall. The content of the video will have a description of the technique, the scope of the use, what are the variants of the rehabilitation technique that you may find in the field, what are the types of behavior that are more prevalent, and what are the basic considerations for the analysis and design, as well as for its construction and inspection. The idea is that this family of videos will be supported on video itself and photos and animation, depending on the quality of material that we have available. But uh, the idea is eventually to develop a family of videos that will improve the, the knowledge, and as I said, the uniformity of the knowledge among the people that participate. Uh, this is uh, my uh, almost my last slide. This is related to other work that we have been developing that is related to the legal framework in which uh, the Mexico City, being, uh, Mexico City construction is being carried out. So far, we have a, a, a building code that is, exists since uh, the 1920s. Uh, however, uh, we don't have a law that actually provides a much uh, uh, a, 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 a stronger or I would say robust framework for the developing or building an urban infrastructure. So we have been working with the Mexico City authorities to developing a, a new law that will have different uh, objectives, uh, providing legal certainty for all parties involved, of course, owner, uh, contractors, designers, et cetera, a legal certainty for and promotional investments, particularly in this area where COVID-19 has affected quite severely the economy of our cities. This is of significant, this is important. Um, uh, of course, it will provide minimum requirements on safety, quality, durability, and promotion of sustainability and water and energy efficiency, particularly emphasis on attaining a resilience, uh, resilient city, and also uh, to, uh, to try to have an adequate balance uh, from an economical point of view. Uh, this is also uh, ongoing. And uh, of course, we, we want to, to have this in a couple of years time so that this could be part of the new revision of the Mexico City Building Code which has to be issued with all the standards by 2023. I would like to finally again acknowledge and thank the American Carbon Institute for allowing me to present this to you. I hope it has been useful and interesting to you. Thank you very much to ACI and all the people that, that participated and made this possible. But also want to acknowledge uh, my uh, my co-researchers and co-PIs from different universities that uh, had uh, led the efforts of, of the research that I just presented uh, today. And of course, I want to acknowledge a very large group of graduate and undergraduate students from UNAM. I don't have the, the complete list of the students from other universities, like uh, for example, UT San Antonio or Metropolitana or uh, University of Colima, who also had participated, but uh, even though their names are not here, of course, I would like to acknowledge for their participation. Again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, I just uh, want to reiterate my, my, my sincere thanks to Asia. Thank you very much, Sergio. Great presentation. Um, we do have some time for some questions. There is a Q&A tab at the bottom of everyone's screen to submit questions if anyone has any questions. And we'll keep it open for just a couple of minutes to see if any questions come through. <clears throat> it doesn't look like we have any questions. Oh, <laughs> we have a comment that it was a great presentation from Ron Berg. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not able to see you in person, but I hope to see you in Orlando in the few, in few months. Thank you. Well, if we don't have any further questions, um, we will leave it at that today. Again, thank you, Sergio. I know ACI appreciates your assistance today. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, Sergio provided his email so you can reach him directly via that email. Um, but if not, I will go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you all for attending and participating today. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Joel. Thank you.